All right, welcome back everybody to lecture two in the organic chemistry series of online lectures. This lecture is entitled Carbon Hybridization, Learning to Hybridize. So in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about hybridization, which is a technique you hopefully learned in general chemistry, but we're specifically going to apply it to carbon because carbon is so prevalent in organic chemistry. So let's go ahead and get started with today's lesson. So first, um, a brief general chemistry reminder. Uh, we want to ask ourselves, what is hybridization? So hopefully uh, everybody remembers hybridization is when we are talking about S and P orbitals that are merging together in order to create new lower energy SP orbitals. And this is favorable for bonding. So hybridization is really when the atomic orbitals uh, get ready to form bonds, they're going to take the S and the P orbitals, they're going to combine them together, and that's energetically favorable, and it also allows for overlap of the orbitals. So you're going to have these hybrid orbitals, and when one atom and another atom have the same hybrid orbitals, they come together and those orbitals overlap very nicely in order to share electrons. So that's the general premise of hybridization. So we have a couple of different hybridization uh, hybrids that we talk about. Uh, in organic chemistry, we're going to focus on sp3, sp2, and sp. Now there are sp3d and sp3d2. You can get hybridization in the d orbitals. Those tend to be with inorganic compounds, uh, things that have the 3d orbital available to them. So sometimes you see the halogens, uh, sulfur, phosphorus can violate their octets when they create hybrid orbitals that go past the sp3 level. But because we're mostly dealing with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, um, sometimes the halogens, but the halogens aren't the center atoms when we're dealing with organic chemistry. We're going to focus on sp3 hybridization and below. So let's start with sp3 hybridization, which is by far the most common hybridization of carbon in organic chemistry. Uh, so recall that molecules with a tetrahedral geometry are most often going to occupy the sp3 uh, hybridization. And what we mean by tetrahedral is there are four electron domains around a molecule. So an electron domain is any space that electrons occupy. It could be a bond, single, double, or triple bond would count as one electron domain. And then any number of lone pairs of electrons, each set uh, would count as another electron domain. So carbon, if it has four bonds uh, in its neutral state, is going to normally be tetrahedral in its geometry and its structure. It's going to have four electron domains, and therefore it's going to be an sp3 hybrid when we come across a carbon with four bonds. Uh, you can see this little chart down here. If you've taken my general chemistry courses, this should be familiar, but for those of you that are just joining us, what we're looking at here is really for carbon, the second quantum level, we have the S shell and the P shell filled together. The way that we get carbon with four unpaired electrons is that these S and P orbitals combine together. So look here, we have one orbital with our S. We have three of them with our P. If we merge all of these together into a new set of energy levels, we get four unique SP orbitals. One from the S, three from the P, one plus three is a total of four. So why isn't this called sp4? Because the number at the top of the p, the superscript up there, is referring to the number of p orbitals contributed. We didn't contribute four p orbitals, we contributed three for a total of four hybrid orbitals. So when we say sp3, we're really referring that three is referring to the number of p orbitals that have been contributed here. So you can see, circled in red here, the s and the p, they all combine their orbitals. We get four new orbitals, and we take the four electrons, we shake them up, and we place one into each of the new hybrid orbitals. That's what an sp3 would look like. And each of these lone electrons here are available for bonding with some other atom. So if we want to take a closer look at the sp3 hybrid orbitals, you can see in the diagram here we have two s, that's a spherical. The s orbitals are always spherical. And then we have three different p orbitals. If you look at px, 2px, it's running horizontally across the x-axis. 
2 p y is going up and down as it would on a y axis on a graph and 2 p z is really coming in and out of the screen or the plane if you were to look at a three-dimensional plane there now what happens is these s and these p orbitals come together they hybridize and they form these new sp orbitals which you can see over on the right here after hybridization occurs so for a tetrahedral we have four of these new sp orbitals and notice they look almost like half of the dumbbell shape. There's really a smaller negative region here that's the smaller side of that hybrid orbital. It's really the S and the P orbitals coming together. So when I have SP3, I'm really 25% S character and I am 75% P character. Because if I look at the breakdown, I have one S and three P's out of 100%, three fourths would be 75% for the P, one fourth for the S, because it only contributed one orbital, would be 25% S character. So this is sort of what these hybrid orbitals would look like. So continuing on here, if we take a look at ethane, which is a very simple organic molecule, and its hybridization, we can see that it's sp3. So ethane would be a CH3 and another CH3 attached to one another. So I have two carbons, if you look at the bottom here, two carbons with a single bond, and then they have three hydrogens surrounding the carbon. That would be ethane, and you can see the ball and stick model over here that we have. Uh, so if we take a look at this individually, we have two sp3 carbons. You have a carbon here, a carbon here. If you look at these pink orbitals, those are the sp3 orbitals that are going to overlap with one another in order to form the carbon-carbon bond, which we see in the middle here. And if you think about it, what are each of these little green balloons or green sp3 orbitals that are left out to the side for? Well, those are each going to be for a hydrogen that would come in. And remember, hydrogen cannot have hybridization because it has no p orbitals available. So hydrogens would just be characterized as s. So each of those s orbitals that would have one electron would come in and would bond with the sp3 orbitals. They would overlap them to create the hydrogen bonds. So ethane has a sp3 hybridization. So let's go ahead and take a look at sp2 hybridization, which is the next one. So for sp2, hopefully you realize if the number up top is referring to the number of p orbitals donated, an sp2 hybrid has only donated two of its p orbitals. It is keeping a p orbital behind. And what we want to think about is why would we need to keep a p orbital behind? Well, usually what ends up happening, not all the time, but most of the time, is that that p orbital is being reserved for pi electrons. So remember we have sigma electrons involved in single bonds and pi electrons are going to be involved in double or triple bonds. Uh, and so again, I, I want to remind you, sp3 is the most common hybridization for carbon, uh, but it is certainly not the only hybrid formation. We definitely have sp2 and sp when we're dealing with organic molecules. Uh, so when carbon is involved in a double bond, it must keep a p orbital behind uh, that is unhybridized. We don't want to hybridize that p orbital in order for pi electrons to reside in that p orbital. And this means only two of the three p orbitals can be donated to the hybridization. So we see the red circle around the two p orbitals here. This one over on the left is going to be left behind uh, for pi electrons, and we're still going to donate the s. So we have s and then two of the p's to make sp2. We're keeping one of these p's behind, and you can see a total of three electrons circled, three electrons equally distributed to the hybrid orbitals. So these will act just like the sp3's did, these hybrid orbitals. However, there's going to be one p orbital left behind. And this looks a little bit different, so let's take a look at it. Uh, the sp2 hybrid only has three hybrid orbitals available for bonding of sigma electrons. The remaining unhybridized p orbital is going to be reserved for the pi electrons in a double bond. So if you look at the sp2 model here, and we're going to talk about ethylene, all right, uh, which is sp2 hybridized, ethylene is the same model as ethane, except there's a double bond between the carbons, which leaves only enough room for two hydrogens on the outer skirts of each carbon. So take a look at the left here. See these up and down? They're sort of a purplish-blue uh, p orbital. 
you can see the dumbbell running up and down. These would be PY orbitals that are running along this axis here. We're going to save a P orbital on each carbon so it can form a double bond. These are where the pi electrons are going to be held, in the upper P orbital level and in the lower P orbital level. The pi electrons are going to circulate between those two areas. Uh, and then you can see the little green ones, the green sp2 hybrid orbitals out on the sides are going to be for the hydrogens. And then the in-between here is going to be where the first carbon-carbon sigma bond happens. And so if we jump over to the left here, we can see we have to start with a carbon-carbon single bond. Then we can make a carbon-carbon double bond where the pi electrons will occupy this p orbital space around the single bond. It's going to rotate above and below the single bond. Then on the side would be just like in the sp3 case, we have these sp2 hybrid orbitals and they will be available for bonding to the hydrogens. So finally, let's take a look at sp hybridization. Oh, and remember, I want to mention one uh, briefly. The sp2 hybrid only has three electron domains because it's got the double bond and then two single bonds. Remember, a double bond counts as one electron domain. So therefore, it's going to have a trigonal planar geometry, um, and the bond angle is going to be roughly 120 between each of those bonds. It would be 109.5 for a tetrahedral with the sp3. So let's take a look at the sp hybridization. Uh, you should understand by now, again, the number, there's an implied 1. When we write sp, it's just 1p, okay? When we're talking about sp hybridization, we're going to leave behind two p orbitals, and we're going to take a look at just one s orbital and one p orbital merging together in order to form sp, okay? So the two p orbitals behind, again, are going to be left for pi electrons, most likely. And so if we take a look at what's called acetylene, which is carbon triple bonded to carbon, and then we have the two hydrogens, we can get a rough idea or feel for this. So it's going to be somewhat similar to the sp2 hybrid, except it's going to keep two p orbitals behind instead of just one p orbital behind. The sp hybrid has the two unhybridized p orbitals, which will allow two sets of pi electrons. And this can be used as either two double bonds or one triple bond. And the sp hybrids only have two electron domains, and so they're going to have a linear geometry with 180 degrees, a straight line between the bonds. So if we take a look here, this starts to get complex, all right? The sp hybrid orbitals are these green ones here. That's where the overlap comes. So the first set that's green here that you can see my arrow over, that set is for the first carbon-carbon single bond. The other ones that are green on the outside are going to be for the hydrogen because we have to connect a hydrogen to the carbon-carbon triple bond. The up and down that are blue are one set of p orbitals. The back and forth, which would be like a PZ, uh, that are pink, are going to be the second set of Z, uh, I'm sorry, the second set of P orbitals. And we are going to have electrons that occupy both sets of P orbitals. So this starts to look very complex. If you come over to the right here, the green in between there, that's the single bond. All right. And then if you look at the blue, we have electrons circulating above and below the sigma bond. And then if you look at the pink, we really have another set of pi electrons rotating to the left and to the right. So we have above and below and then left and right of that sigma bond that is a carbon-carbon single bond. So we have the single bond, then a double bond with a p orbital, and then a triple bond with another p orbital, and then the hydrogens would be on the outside of that carbon-carbon triple bond. So as we move along, uh, most students in my class tend to like this method of solving for hybridization because it's the easiest one. Uh, it, it's certainly legitimate, but I encourage you to learn hybridization the proper way. Uh, but the hybridization cheat method is N minus 1, and this works well, especially in organic chemistry when you don't have those d orbitals. So um, to use the n minus 1 rule, it's going to be where n is the number of electron domains around an atom of interest, and n minus 1 will equal the value that is assigned to p in the sp hybridization. So you will solve the number of electron domains, that'll be n. You're going to take n minus 1, and whatever n minus 1 equals is the number of p orbitals that were contributed. So let's take a look here. If we take a look at the carbon on the left here, I've got one, two, three, four bonds around it. That's four electron domains, 
4 minus 1 is 3, so this would be sp3. So hopefully you guys get the idea. If I come to this one, this carbon here has 1, 2, and remember the double bond counts as only one electron domain, so 3. If this carbon only has 3 electron domains, 3 minus 1 is 2, that's sp2. If this one only has 2 electron domains over on the right here, 2 minus 1 is 1, so it would just be sp. So hopefully this method, and you can test it out, uh, will make sense. I also just want to mention, you can find hybridization for other atoms besides carbon. We focused on carbon because it's organic chemistry, but oxygen, nitrogens, um, any of those other atoms can certainly have hybridizations. You just want to follow the same rules. And remember, lone pairs, when we get to those atoms, also count as an electron domain when we're determining hybridization. So, um, that pretty much wraps up hybridization. This was sort of a brief overview. If you are struggling with it, I would strongly encourage you to go back to the molecular geometry chapter that I have posted in the general chemistry section. You can review hybridization there in a bit more detail, uh, and then you can brush up some on it here again, organic chemistry. So, as always, thank you um, for watching and continue learning and investing in your knowledge. Thanks very much for watching. Please remember to like if you found this video helpful. If you comment, I will do my best to get back to your comments, or just feel free to leave a comment if you found something uh, useful. And please subscribe if you have the time to. It will be the easiest way for me to get in touch with you when future videos come up, uh, and it will allow you to go through playlists and things like that. So uh, thanks again, guys, and I will see you guys for the next lesson. We're going to start Chapter 2, which will be polar covalent bonds and some acid-base chemistry. Thanks, guys.